Hi, thanks for watching BibleMountain.com. In this video, we're going to read from Exodus 15 and 16 and talk about why God doesn't prevent suffering. When Hurricane Harvey slammed into the Texas coast, it brought a lot of flooding, destruction, and death, caused many pe people to be homeless, caused poverty. And many people looked at that and they said, where is God? Why doesn't God prevent this suffering? There are many ways to answer the question, why doesn't God prevent suffering? In this video, we're going to look at a story from Exodus that provides one possible explanation for why God doesn't prevent suffering. Now, let's establish a little bit of context before we get into Exodus chapter 15. We're going to start at verse 22, and that verse tells us that after the Israelites crossed the Red Sea, they went into the wilderness of Shur. Now, you see the word Shur there in the yellow circle. That tells us about where the area of Shur was, and so the wilderness of Shur would be within that circle. The blue circle is the traditional site for the crossing of the Red Sea. Now, some people think that the crossing of the Red Sea took place in the green circle, but if they went to the wilderness of Shur after crossing the Red Sea, then that almost has to place the crossing of the Red Sea somewhere within the blue circle. Now the location and the fact that they were going into the wilderness of Shur is important because of the contrast between where the Israelites had been. The red circle shows us uh, roughly where the Israelites had lived for the 400 years when they were in Egypt and during the time that they were slaves in Egypt. And they lived in the Nile Delta region. The Nile Delta was fairly flat. It had plenty of water and plenty of food. And so the Israelites never had problems with running out of food and water while they were in the Nile Delta. However, after they crossed the Red Sea and went into the wilderness of Shur, they were in a desert region. The desert does not have much water and much food. And so these Israelites, on the one hand, they were ecstatic to get out of slavery and escape Egypt. On the other hand, they went from an area that had plenty of food and water to a wilderness area that had very little food and water. And that caused a lot of problems, and we're going to see some of those problems in the passage that we're going to read today. So let's get started with Exodus chapter 15, starting at verse 22. Then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. When they came to Marah, they could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore the place was named Marah. So the people grumbled at Moses, saying, what shall we drink? So again, the Israelites had been used to plenty of water back when they were in Egypt. Now they're out in the wilderness, there's very little water, and they finally find some water, and it's bitter. Now, notice I have the word bitter highlighted in red. The Hebrew word that is translated bitter is the Hebrew word mara. And you see that that then is the name that they gave to this place where the waters were bitter. And that's a good example of how they they gave names back in Bible times. Oftentimes, the name of a person or the name of a place would tell you something about that person or something about that place. In this particular place, the name Mara was a reminder that when the Israelites got to this particular place, uh, the waters were bitter, and it was a reminder because the term Mara meant bitter. Now let's continue reading at verse 25. Then Moses cried out to Yahweh, and Yahweh showed Moses a tree. And Moses threw the tree into the waters, and the waters became sweet. There God made for the Israelites a statute and regulation, and there he tested them. And let's stop. Notice the word tested. In our culture, we tend to think that God would not test people. We tend to think that God is, you know, the conventional wisdom in our culture is that God is sweet and nice and would never do anything mean to anybody. And testing, on the other hand, implies difficulty and perhaps consequences, and so we think that God would not test people. But we see here, very clearly, God did test the Israelites. And then this gives us an idea why God would not necessarily prevent suffering. In this case, God allowed the Israelites to go out into the wilderness. He allowed them to go into an area where there was little food and water, and allowed them to suffer a little bit so that he could test them to see whether they would indeed remain loyal to him. So let's continue reading there, just after the word tested, starting at verse 26. And he said, 
If you will give earnest heed to the voice of Yahweh your God and do what is right in his sight and give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have put on the Egyptians, for I, Yahweh, am your healer. Then the Israelites came to Elim, where there were twelve springs of water and seventy date palms, and they camped there beside the waters. Then the Israelites set out from Elim, and all the congregation of the sons of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elim and Sinai, on the fifteenth day of the second month after their departure from the land of Egypt. The whole congregation of the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The sons of Israel said to them, Would that we had died by Yahweh's hand in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the pots of meat, when we ate bread to the full, for you have brought us out into the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then Yahweh said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I may test them, whether or not they will walk in my instruction. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. So again, notice the word test. Again, in our culture, the conventional wisdom is God is too sweet and nice to test people, but we see here an example that God did test the Israelites. Testing implies some difficulty and consequences. And so this gives us an idea why God sometimes allows suffering to come into our lives. Now, perhaps he's testing us just as God was testing the Israelites. God allowed the Israelites to suffer a little bit so that he could test them to see whether they would stay loyal to him no matter how difficult life got. Now let's continue reading at verse 6. Right there in the middle. So Moses and Aaron said to all the sons of Israel, At evening you will know that Yahweh has brought you out of the land of Egypt, and in the morning you will see the glory of Yahweh, for he hears your grumblings against Yahweh. And what are we that you grumble against us? Moses said, this will happen when Yahweh gives you meat to eat in the evening and bread to the full in the morning. For Yahweh hears your grumblings which you grumble against him. And what are we? Your grumblings are not against us, but against Yahweh. Now notice that statement there at the end. Your grumblings are not against us, but against Yahweh. That was a very important uh, fact that Moses stated there. Moses understood that even though the Israelites were grumbling against Moses and blaming Moses for their predicament, Moses understood that it was God who had brought the Israelites out into the wilderness. And Moses understood that ultimately when the Israelites were complaining, they were complaining against God. Now that's important for us to remember. In our culture, when we go out and speak the truth and teach the truth, oftentimes we're going to face hostility and opposition to the truth. And sometimes that hostility and opposition is directed at those of us who speak the truth and teach the truth. And at that time, we have to remember that ultimately they're not really directing their hostility uh, against us, although in a way they are, but ultimately they are really expressing hostility and opposition to God. Because God is the one who stated the truth. God's the one who put the truth into the Bible. And for those of us who teach the Bible, uh, when we go out and teach truth and state truth, if we uh, receive opposition, we have to remember, just as Moses did, we have to keep in mind that ultimately they're complaining about God and not us. Now let's look at a verse also in 1 Peter 4, getting back to the topic of why doesn't God prevent suffering. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you which comes upon you for your testing as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of His glory, you may rejoice with exultation. So notice the word testing there in the third line. And, and here it says, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal. Um, because these, these things that come into our lives, the suffering, um, oftentimes that comes to us for testing. And so again, when we ask the question, why doesn't God prevent suffering? Sometimes God allows suffering so that he can test us. He wants to see how loyal we are to him. Are we really, do we really truly believe in God enough to follow him, obey him, and stay loyal when life gets difficult and when suffering comes into our lives?